Right, so my title is a joke, but you won't get it unless you're a computer scientist. So nothing is a monadic error value, which you'll understand if you take our MOOCs, you go, ha ha, I knew nothing, and now I understand nothing. But you don't because you haven't taken the MOOC. But if you take the next one of our MOOC, you will laugh happily at this joke here. Good. So we want to tell you about our functional programming course, um, which ran in the university and as an online MOOC. So this is what we were talking about before, you know. This is the kind of boring, branded, navy blue, traditional university 10 credit honours module, CompSci 4021, which ran in the traditional, boring, face-to-face, -face, ordinary way up until 2015. And after that, we decided to jazz things up. And so we turned Functional Programming H into Supercharge Your Coding, Functional Programming in Haskell, which was hosted on the FutureLearn platform. And they were really keen on branding. So we told them we want to use a dragon because here be dragons. This is scary stuff, you know. And so we got our nice little dragon. My colleague, Wim, went on a holiday to Japan and took a photo of a drinking fountain in Japan with the water spewing out of the dragon's mouth. But they said, no, no, your branding still isn't good enough. It needs to be even more zappier and cooler. And so they did that to it and put a blue transparent <laughs> overlay on top and lots of Greek symbols, which are very important, particularly the lambda symbol top left. That's a key element of functional programming. So here we go. We're all jazzed up and ready to go with our MOOC. So first of all, you might be asking, if you're not a computer scientist, well, what is Haskell? OK, so I'm going to give you the one minute crash course in Haskell. And here is um, a root mean square calculation. So if you were doing this in, oh, are there any programmers amongst us? Any, any um, C programmers or Java? Oh, yes. Hello, John. Good. So you would obviously use a for loop to do this, wouldn't you? And you'd loop over your floating point array of, of values. And you'd have maybe 10 lines of code to do a root mean square calculation. Here we can do it in. Well, it didn't quite fit on one line, but maybe two lines there. So it's, it's very concise, and it's a very kind of mathematical um, um, uh, model for expressing your, your computations. And most importantly, there's growing interest from big beasts in industry. Microsoft, Facebook, um, Standard Chartered Bank, and um, lots of other big IT organisations are eating up all the Haskell programs we can supply them with. This is the next big thing in terms of software engineering. OK. Now, Glasgow was instrumental in the development of this Haskell programming language. And I spoke to one of the people who actually originally came up with Haskell back in the 80s and 90s. And he said Haskell was, uh, sorry, Glasgow was the epicenter of, of Haskell development. So. You can tell it's the 80s or 90s. Look at those jumpers. Here are all the people who were involved in Haskell development back in the day. And uh, Simon Peyton Jones there was a professor at uh, the computer science department. Um, John O'Donnell up there has just won a Teaching Excellence Award this year. And uh, he's still at Glasgow. Most of the others have um, disappeared, dissipated, and they've um, uh, gone off and done uh, great things. But in the 90s, Haskell was happening here in Glasgow. It's probably the most famous famous programming language to come out of Scotland. I think I can say that without fear of contradiction. So Glasgow is well known for Haskell, which is why we want to capitalise on it. Firstly, this is a marketing opportunity. We can say, Edinburgh, St Andrews? No, come to Glasgow. We are the home of great Scottish programming languages. So in terms of Glasgow Computer and Science, it's good for marketing, right? But also, it's good for our graduates. You know, if somebody bumps into a Glasgow University computer science graduate and says, ah, you know about functional programming, and they don't, then that looks quite bad on us. If we invented Haskell and functional programming and then our students can't do it very well, that's not good. So this was an optional course. Maybe a third of our fourth year students took this functional programming course. So we jazzed it up and now they all take it. Ha ha. It's still an optional course, but they all do it. Good. So this is what we did. This was 2015 and BC. OK, we had a kind of 10 week traditional course. We split this into two halves. We teach the first half in an online way using the MOOC platform FutureLearn. And we also throw that open, not just to our 124th year students, but to the world at large. They can, anybody can sign up and take this MOOC. 
And then for our local students, we also have a drop-in clinic so they can come along and see us if they have problems and get that kind of value add that the other MOOC participants can't because they're not paying tuition fees or at least SAS isn't paying tuition fees for them. And then towards the end of the course, we have a kind of four-week advanced segment, which we might MOOCify one day, but for the moment, this is just taught in the kind of old-fashioned, traditional way. <coughs> Good. So um, we used, thanks to Vicky's um, um, advice, the arena blended curriculum design um, process, and we came up with all these wonderful activities, which map quite neatly onto things like programming and peer assessment of code and watching videos and reading uh, technical reports, if not um, four-star research papers, and um, talking to people about, you know, different styles of programming. Okay. But actually, I think we could boil this down to three unique selling points for our course. Unique in terms of computer science courses offered at Glasgow, and maybe even more so than that, actually. So we do interactive coding. When you're writing computer programs, it's really important to be able to get that instantaneous feedback. I was talking to Dennis before, is he still here? And he was telling me about, um, you know, submitting your punch cards. This is back in the 70s, I think. And then the next day, getting back the error, and then you have to go and do it all again. <laughs> so interactive kind of, really kind of um, closed loop feedback in a, a very kind of tight um, uh, time period is really important to try and um, encourage beginners to spread their wings if they're dragons in terms of this programming here. Rockstar interviews. So <sighs> computer programmers are a bit like music fans. They just love the kind of really big, important people. So if we can um, show that these really big, important people are our friends at Glasgow, then that somehow makes us seem more authoritative and also makes our course seem more attractive. And then social learning, the idea of chatting to other people and, um, you know, treating your course as if you were just on Facebook. Interactive coding. So we had inside a web browser an interactive terminal where you type in your programs and get immediate feedback. Look, here's the feedback. No surprises so far, blah, blah, blah. Now do this. And then you kind of work your way through it in quite a scaffolded way, although you can go off piste and do other things. And we kind of track what you do and uh, monitor it and hopefully respond to it. Rockstar interviews. Look, the guy's wearing exactly the same jumper as he was in 1988. <laughs> and this was last year. I don't know whether he kind of bought five of them and he's working his way through them, but <laughs> Simon Peyton Jones still has exactly the same jumper. And uh, so I interviewed him and um, several other people. This lady here from Facebook, she's one of the star Haskell coders at Facebook. Um, I went down to London and got a free Facebook breakfast and interviewed her. And also social learning. So look at this, right? These are the kind of conversations people are having in the Future Learn comment section actually on the course. Right, so here's one student, I blanked his name out. Zip, that's a, a Haskell feature. Reminds me a bit of linear algebra. So he's linking the, the functional code coding up with the kind of mathematical principles and leaf. And then he says, it's also called transposing groovy. He's saying, look, here's another programming language I know about. And that's how it maps onto this. So he's kind of making all these connections himself or herself, I suppose. And then our handy mentor, Chris, says, indeed, blah, 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 and goes into great detail to try and reinforce the thing for him. OK. Sometimes the mentors didn't even get involved. The students just did it by themselves. So look, lambda function introduction, you should have done this. Yes, you can do that. Look, here it's on Wikipedia. And then they're talking to each other. And you know, if they made mistakes, we would jump in and say, well, actually, that's not quite right. But we didn't have to do that very often because we found that some of these um, um, MOOC learners were actually more expert than we were. There were some real, you know, big wigs in there who actually came in and helped out in a very altruistic way to um, try and um, engage the, the novice learners. OK, and then we even got some kind of really nice feedback about the course design. So look at this. The best teaching video in the course so far. That's what I did. Oh, good. And gushing, <laughs> excellent presentation, blah, 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 and so on and so on. So just some stats. Um, I'm afraid we're not as good as Burns, but never mind. We had about 6,000 people sign up for the MOOC. Of those, 3,000 people actually did something. OK, 900 people completed the course. That means they were eligible to pay £50 for a certificate from FutureLearn. And I hope that this is kind of in the, um, 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 this, this group here is contained in all these other groups here. 120 of these students were our Glasgow students. That's the first six weeks, and then we carried on for the other four weeks with more advanced stuff. People came from all over the world to do our MOOC. Didn't get anyone from Antarctica, but apart from that, we did pretty well, I think. Really interesting. You know, with MOOCs, you see this kind of exponential drop off. People kind of sign up, do a little bit and then stop. Other people carry on to the bitter end. And we even see that drop off 
here in terms of the interactive coding. So this is how long people spend on the web actually coding um, programs up in each of their sessions, so each of their learning activities. And we wanted them to be spending about 15 minutes, that's the red line there, and actually most of them didn't spend that long. And the kind of <laughs> mode amount of time that people spent on it was not very much time at all. So you really can see the same MOOC behaviour in individual exercises as you do in the whole course as a whole kind of fractal MOOC pattern there. <laughs> we wrote a paper about it, woo! So we use this for research. Basically, we were logging all their activities, not necessarily to report back to them individually, but so we could kind of capture the learner behaviour as a whole and come up with some kind of um, recommendations and analysis of where people were making mistakes, what they got wrong and how the language could change or the pedagogy could change or the learning resources could change to improve things. Okay, over to Alex who's going to tell us about the kind of student response to the course. So yeah, the student walks in. Um, so basically as computing scientists we are exposed to a lot of um, online courses here and there and because like of what industry requires and you want to have experience and so on. So most of us have started and some of us have completed online courses but this was quite different because it was part of our university experience and we weren't really meant to go in a lecture theater, sit there, pretend we are interested and then walk away. No offense here, you're all great lectures. Um, <laughs> um, so basically one main thing is um, that I kind of find really useful in online courses, like how you ask questions. Because in a lecture theatre, and like we are encouraged on a daily basis, you should ask questions, engage and so on and so on. But then asking questions is actually trickier than it looks. It's just from phrasing the question to being like, oh I don't really want to ask a stupid question and then you get, oh there are no stupid questions, come on, go on, go on, ask. Well, we don't really feel the same way, but with online, like online, we are kind of braver. We can go and just ask and we expect like, and people are coming from various backgrounds. So chances are that someone will have the same question and answer. And that kind of um, relates to my next point that we have the flexibility of completing six weeks of Haskell in one sitting. Oh, they don't really, I haven't really heard of anyone doing this. But anyway, and then we have the time to go back and forth, take control of our own learning, go to the library and get the book on Haskell. Although I don't really have my new library card, so probably I won't be able to get them, but never mind. Um, and basically this is great because you can just like step back, Google a few things, watch a YouTube video on like Haskell stuff, programming, Mona, it's a big scary word, remember this one? Um, and this is actually great. Um, and of course we had like the drop-in clinics with Jeremy and basically even if you don't have questions you just go because Jeremy would probably think jump around or something like this so that always helps. <laughs> um, also I think that those sessions were an excellent opportunity to actually kind of gather feedback because he always starts with oh how do you find it what do you think and for example like what do you think of like the additional resources why do you think not many Glasgow students engage with like posting questions and so on and that was really helpful and I think we felt that actually the kind of he cares about what we think and like he takes those things into consideration which is great when it comes to you know feedback and our feedback and all of those buzzwords um, and then I think the learning materials were great in terms of having quizzes, articles, interviews. We've had like interviews with like amazing people from Facebook um, and when you talk about gender roles, oh she's a programmer, she's programming in Haskell, a difficult functional language, oh my gosh I want to be like her um, and actually um, as Jeremy mentioned like rock stars, well we don't really need a lot of like inventors of programming languages because most of them are dead by the time their language is popular um, but what happened is that like those were great interviews and like Haskell as Jeremy said was happening here in Glasgow so some of those points you're going to see on this slide kind of are repeating like my previous words um, but one very important thing um, like a few weeks ago we four years had about like eight exams which was quite painful but it's always helpful to know that those online resources are there. Not that I'm trying to make a point about lecture recordings here, <coughs> uh, but it's really good to be able to go back to those resources, like watch the videos and be like, oh, I get it now. Um, one thing, well, all sounds too good to be true. Well, as computing scientists, basically our way of learning is the following. We get lectures with basic concepts and then basically in first and second year and to an extent in third year we had labs which is where learning happens because like com programming you kind of learn by doing not by this okay yeah, yeah I understand cool 
Um, so I think that we kind of missed that because we got trained to have those lab sessions. And while we were able to pick on like the basics from the future learn, and the drop-in clinics were really helpful because like Jeremy was circulating and being like, okay, that concept is clear, explaining things to people, encouraging people to work in groups. I think that like we missed the labs and just having that allocated space and time. Um, basically, remember the word monad? Well, that's basically like the word Voldemort in Harry Potter and you, should, you don't really want to mention it. When you go online and search for a uh, monad, basically people start. This is a really difficult concept in Haskell, but we will try to simplify it. Oh, they kind of explain it with like warm fuzzy things and things like this, but not all of this helps. And um, so basically by the time we got to this concept, it was kind of towards the end of the course. So, and even though um, the articles, videos and all that tried to help us get a better understanding of it, it was still kind of difficult. I'm sorry, uh, but um, and I think that like a slight shifting around of concepts and just like towards the end of the course will definitely help improve it. But overall, I think we were happy and hopefully we will all go get A's when we get our results <laughs> next week. Exam board tomorrow, yes, good. Right, so to conclude, this is my last slide. In terms of the inputs to this course, the investment, money, so Frank kindly gave us £20,000, thank you Frank, and uh, we use that to develop the course. Hopefully this course is going to live for a good number of years and with kind of minor updating and kind of uh, refreshing it should be good to, uh, to last for the next decade, I should think. Um, in terms of time, um, it took six months of my life to do this um, and my colleague's life as well, Wim, who can't be here today. Um, so it was probably a big investment, but now we've done it, we can kind of roll it out again and again and um, hopefully um, it will be um, you know, of, of continuing um, use to um, local students and also to, uh, to MOOC learners as well. Outcomes, students are happier. So I went and looked at the old kind of Moodle feedback from the last time the course ran and the profile was mostly, we are grumpy. I went to look at our new shiny Evasys feedback this year and the, the feedback was mostly, we are very happy. So well, I think students are better. There are more students as well. So um, the last year the course ran in the old way, there were 50 students, this year there were 120 students, not only fourth year undergraduate, but also some master's students as well signed up for this as an optional module. And we got a paper out of it, trends in functional programming in education is being rocked by Haskell. So that's very exciting. Good. Thank you, everybody.